Hi, everyone. Oh, this mic works. Um, welcome to our session on women in quantum and diversity. And uh, what we want to do today is have a very interactive session. And so I hope that if you all have questions or comments, you'll raise your hand and join in the discussion. And we're looking forward. We have a couple topics that we would love to hear your input on. So why don't we start out by having the panelists introduce themselves? And we're gonna start off with Laura Lewis. Hi, I'm Laura Lewis. Um, I currently do research with Professor Soma Vidic here at Caltech, um, where I work on quantum cryptography, mainly in classical verification of quantum computations. And I'm also starting a project with Professor John Preskill on um, essentially trying to expand on Robert Huang's plenary talk yesterday. Um, oh yes, I'm an undergrad. Um, I'm a third year studying math and computer science. Great, Harriet. Hello. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Harriet April, and I'm at UCL in London. Um, I'm Toby Cubitt's PhD student in my second year. Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Gabel. I'm originally from Spain, but now I'm working in Germany. I recently uh, got a position as a junior professor in the University of Tübingen, which is a lovely city in the southwest of Germany, in case you want to visit. And I'm working on the interplay between quantum information theory and quantum many value systems, mostly on problems related to dissipative evolution. So uh, many value systems governed by quantum Markovian semigroups. I'm Sandy Orani. I'm a professor at UC Irvine, and I hate to admit this, but I've been there for 30 years now. So I'm like, I'm providing age to diversity on the panel here today. Um, I work at the intersection of computational complexity and quantum computation. Um, and I teach courses uh, in theory, discrete math, and on up the spectrum in quantum computation at the undergraduate and graduate levels as well. Thank you, Sandy. So part of what we wanted to talk about today is career progression and kind of how people make the next steps in their career and how they make their decisions. And so I wanted to start off with Angela to describe her career a little bit so all of you can see her decision points and learn a little bit about her progression. Okay, so maybe I can tell you a little bit. So I studied actually a bachelor degree in mathematics. So I'm mostly mathematician. And well, after that, I studied some master's program also in theoretical mathematics because it's mostly what I like, but I also like physics a lot. So this is why I decided to start doing some things related to quantum information. And after my PhD also in mathematics, but with a focus on, on quantum information theory in Madrid, I moved uh, as a postdoc to the Technical University of Munich. And well, I was there actually just for a year and a half, which was essentially the COVID time. And I, as I told you before, I recently got a position in another place in, in Germany. So that was actually sort of a surprise. I was planning to do a, another postdoc, but then this position appeared and I thought it would be an interesting development for, for my career. So this is why I decided to, to take it. Great, Sandy. Yeah, sure. So um, I probably have a more unusual path to quantum. So I've been at UC at Irvine, as I said, for quite some time, and I got my PhD at UC Berkeley. Um, and I've always been part of the theoretical computer science community. So I've always worked on algorithms and basically proof theorems for a living. Um, most of my career was spent on pretty applied algorithmic work to computer systems. So stuff like memory management and resource allocation and power management strategies, um, very applied. 
and about 15 years ago, I'd say, um, I kind of had a midlife crisis, I guess. And um, I, I was kind of bored with what I was doing. It wasn't satisfying to me. And I thought about different options. What could I do differently? Do I get a different job? Maybe move to industry, something. Um, and what I ended up doing is I just said, well, I'm at a university. I'm just going to learn something new I haven't learned before. So I sat in on um, a physical chemistry class. Um, we learned the quantum mechanics of like the hydrogen atom and derived the orbitals and stuff. And that was fun. And I decided I wanted to start working in quantum computation. So I, you know, literally sat in my office for about a year working through problem sets, teaching myself from various class notes that I found online and eventually started working in the field and publishing papers. So, um, and one of the things that's just wonderful about being an academic is that I didn't have to ask anyone's permission to do that. As long as I, you ultimately become productive again in whatever field you choose. And it was a pretty abrupt change for me, um, but you just have a tremendous academic freedom to pick what you wanna work on. So, um, and I took full advantage of that. So, and, it, and I have to say, I found this community um, incredibly welcoming and it's been really a great change for me, so. I, think I do think it is a wonderful community of people, very supportive. And I wanted to ask Laura and Harriet how they got into quantum computing or what drove, what kind of motivated you to go here? Okay, uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so I was uh, at Cambridge studying my undergrad um, in like physical natural sciences. And um, it was good. Like I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed like, learning I was like having having fun doing my courses but I didn't really know what I was doing and I think the intel I didn't really know what, what I wanted to do after university um and I was on the classic like stress of trying to get like summer internships every year like that sort of roundabout of productivity um and I went to UCL to do like an experimental quantum computing internship with John Morton um, and yeah, I wasn't really that keen on like the experiment side of it. Like I didn't really, um, that definitely maybe wasn't my skill set. but I found UCL like a really lovely place and felt a lot more comfortable there and was obviously introduced to quantum computing on a more, like as in a more general sort of, yeah, just like as a general topic. Um, and then went back to Cambridge and realized that there's like a theory side of it as well, which kind of joined my the interest in it being like a, yeah, like an application that I was interested in, but also um, using something that I'm a bit better at rather than like building things. Um, so yeah, and then I moved to UCL to do a master's. Um, I met Toby and then really enjoyed the master's project I did there. So then I've sort of just stayed at UCL for, for your PhD, right? Yeah, for my, yeah, yeah. so I then um, I applied to your PhD uh, at UCL after my master's, and that's where I am now. Great. Yeah, I think um, my journey was a little bit different. Um, I think, so I think it started in high school for me. I attended like a summer program and um, I was taking some like quantum mechanics courses. And I thought that it was pretty interesting because it was very like confusing. I feel like no one really understands how quantum mechanics really works. And I thought that that was interesting. I wanted to try to figure that out. Um, and so then when I came to Caltech, then I heard um, we have like these pizza courses, which are over lunch and they give you pizza, which is why it's called the pizza course. And um, there was a talk by, I forget, I think it was Adam Weirman about um, just like trying to get involved in like CS and combining it with something else. And he had mentioned like CS and quantum physics in quantum computation. And I thought that that was really interesting. And he, um, I reached out to him after that and he recommended given my background in like math and computer science to reach out to Professor Vidic. Um, and ever since then, then um, yeah, I guess the rest is history. I started working with him and yeah, he really took me under his wing and mentored me to yeah, get me to where I am now and learning all about quantum computing. So I think that raises a really good point, which is mentorship is important for all of us um, in our careers. 
and how you find a mentor is sometimes anecdotal, like going to a course, or it could be meeting someone at a conference. Um, maybe all of you could talk about your mentors and how you found them and how they've helped you a little bit in your career. Uh, Sandy, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, sure. Um, I feel like I've had quite a few important mentors. Um, I, as a PhD student, I didn't work that closely with my advisor, but I found a different mentor who sort of took me under his wing and we worked a lot together. Um, one of the things I wish I had been told when I was a graduate student, I mean, I came into Berkeley and I felt like everyone was writing papers like from the first day they set their foot on campus and it was incredibly intimidating. So, you know, one of the things that I wish I had been told or knew at the time that it's okay to take a little time to figure out what you want to do, that everybody kind of works at a different pace and that's okay and thinks in different ways. Um, nowadays, I feel like I, I still have mentors, but they're not necessarily older than me. They're, I just, I'm learning from people at all ages of the spectrum and, and sometimes it's the the, the younger folks who have interesting and very wise things to say. So um, I guess um, a mentor doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to be someone who's sort of ahead of you in your career or more advanced or experienced. Um, there's really a lot to learn from everyone, so. Yeah, so in my case, I would say also uh, mentoring for me started when I was a teenager, I would say. So I was lucky enough to, to be part of a program of, of teenagers that received like some teaching in mathematics, let's say, apart from, from the high school curricula. And we were meeting every, every week when, with some professors from the university that were teaching us like fun stuff. And, you know, we were surrounded by nerds like us. So that was actually pretty cool to, to get to know uh, like some other teenagers with similar interests as you. And this is the first time that I really felt that I was being mentored in a, a direction that was being useful for me. And well, after that, of course, I've uh, had some important uh, professors during my uh, bachelor degree that have made me go like in one direction or, or the other. And then I was extremely lucky to have a, a PhD supervisor as David who's here. So, I mean, that, that was really helpful for my PhD and for making the decision of continuing in academia after that. And also the, the mentors that I found in my postdoc position in, in Munich, like Robert and Michael, they were also extremely helpful with everything. So I can say I've been really, really lucky. And, but I, I would also like be more in the direction that Sandy was mentioning, that sometimes it's just the people that you find in conferences or I don't know, you go to, to a program and then you meet someone uh, from whom you've been reading papers all the time. And then this person suddenly goes to talk to you and knows your work and tells you that you are doing like a good job and, and you have proven something cool. And this just, this just gives you strength to continue. So, so I think these kind of conversations, even with more senior people or more junior people, as you're saying, sometimes are even more helpful. So yeah, I, I really think this is something extremely helpful. And Harriet? Um, yeah, so I would say, um, I've also been really lucky in the like people that I've come into contact with um, in the field. And when I first moved to UCL and um, was doing my master's, um, yeah, so Tamara uh, Connor at university at yeah University College London, and she sort of was my um, the PhD student who helped helped me alongside Toby. I think that was like um, just that whole system of. Uh, when you're doing research, you can actually like get to know someone a bit more and talk with people, which I hadn't really uh, like, experienced before uh, at Cambridge. I think that was what really settled me down and like made me uh, like consider again staying in, like yeah, staying in academia and um, trying to find out like what things you could do, like what PhDs you could apply to. I think I would, wouldn't have um, like thought of thought of doing that, or probably would have been a bit more scattered doing that by myself. But no, I definitely, I probably definitely wouldn't have done it if I would like apply for a PhD if I hadn't already um, like been with people who like encouraging me and telling me um, like these are the sorts of things you do, like this is something that is for you and like you have, like have a, like you have a good chance of doing this, you do it. Like I think um, at those stages, like people you 
the people you come into contact with when you first start like your first research project is like probably really um, instrumental in whether you think like research is fun, research, like even if it's like not a project that um, the student likes, like directing them to like other projects or just like reassuring people that, um, yeah, you can have um, just like uh, showing that um, PhDs are something that are accessible because especially in undergrad when you're just like talking to your lecturers and stuff, um, it just feels like a very far off space that you don't really know anything about and it's very daunting. So yeah, that's my experience. Yeah, I think I kind of already went over a little bit of how I got involved in like my mentorship. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo what Harriet said. Definitely also like the the grad student or postdoc mentor also really helped. Like mine was Alexander Giorgio. Um, and he definitely really helped me as well, really getting like up to speed on quantum computing and cryptography. Like I didn't really know anything at first, um, just getting started. And that really helped. Um, one thing that I would also say is I feel like a lot of, especially undergrads, like have trouble with how to first get started with research and how to just like get in touch with a professor. Um, and I feel like cold emailing is okay. Um, a lot of people I feel like don't, um, might think that they need some sort of like bigger connection, but I feel like sometimes just like trying to get out there and just going into someone's email is definitely like a good first step for trying to get in contact with someone that you would want to do research with. So I think that raises a really good point, which is how do you connect with other people in academia, whether it's another professor or another lab or someone whose paper you like, do you need an introduction? Is it good to just email them? Um, what do you think, Sid? Sandy, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like our field is small enough that if you have a, a knowledgeable question to ask and you send a cold email to someone, you'll get a response. Um, so I, you know, we do get a lot of sort of random requests from students, hey, I want to work, you know, in your lab. And it's hard sometimes to satisfy everybody. But if someone has a question about a paper or a technical question, I think it's very, it's, you'll get a response quite easily. And it's a, it's a pretty friendly field. So, um, I mean, not everyone reads their email and responds, you know, as, um, you know, as uh, timely as everyone else, but it's certainly the intentions are good. And if someone's aware that you have a technical question, you'll get a response. So I think that's a perfectly fine way to, way to start. And also at places like QIP, bumping into someone, hey, I've read your paper, um, I had a question about it. That's, you know, it's an incredibly friendly field and group of people for the most part, so. Yeah, I would say that, uh... It depends a lot on the person you ask the question. And it depends on how you are, because when you are a student, if you are sort of shy, sometimes it's difficult to approach a professor and ask a question or just send an email, you know? For me, it was really difficult at the beginning. And I've been reading papers of big shots in the field for a while, right? And then you went to conferences and you saw them. And of course, you didn't go to talk to them. <laughs> and I mean, I, I really like the confidence that some people have. And when you see them going to talk to these people. I mean, I, I love that. I, I really wish that I could have that, but I don't. So it's really true that uh, things like QIP help a lot because then usually you get introduced to some people because some people that you know, know these other people and then, you know, they, they, they introduce you. Or I think it's easier when you send an email because in that way you feel that it's sort of anonymous in some sense, or you don't see the, the reaction of the person when they get the email. So you can always think that it, get, it got lost, you know, and maybe this is why you didn't get a response or something like that. I don't know. You feel less pressure with this situation. But yeah, it depends a lot on the person. So what I would say, I mean, I, I, I know I'm, I'm too young to give advice to anyone or anything, but from the perspective of uh, someone that is pretty junior, please, uh, if you ever have the possibility of approaching like students, um, giving them confidence to, to ask you questions or anything, please do that. Because for us uh, as a students at the beginning, sometimes it's difficult to approach the big shots, you know, and interact with them. So I would always say, say that. But I would also add that we've had some great speakers at the event today. And we also had a breakfast with 
different professors. And I think this conference is a perfect opportunity for all of you to meet people that you've read their papers and you've always wanted to meet. And I encourage everyone to kind of step up and, and say hello to them and compliment them on their work and ask them a question. Um, Laura, I don't know if you want to add to that or. Yeah, I, well, I think, yeah, it's, it takes like a lot of courage, I feel, to go up to a professor and ask, but I actually did that to both Professor and, and Professor Rani here, um, just using like this panel as like a talking point of trying to introduce myself. Um, yeah, and I feel like if you pluck up the courage to do it, then it's something that's really great and you can make a lot of connections that way. All right, so talking about connections, um, we did some preparation for the panel. And one of the uh, topics we talked about was LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is often used as a way to connect people. And so I wanted to ask both the panel and the audience um, if they felt that that was something that they felt was a good tool for them. And uh, I, uh, any answer is good. So uh, Harriet, maybe we'll start with you on LinkedIn, um, whether you use it and if you find it of value in your career. Um, yeah, so I have a, I have a profile. Um, I don't think I'm a very successful user of LinkedIn. If, if there is, yeah, um, just as an, I, I don't really know much about how it works, but I, I guess, cause I'm not in, on Twitter. So maybe people who look at like quantum news on Twitter, I maybe use LinkedIn to kind of, you can see the, com I, the feel I sort of have is there's more industry people on LinkedIn. So getting more like news. Yeah, I guess I kind of get my industry quantum news from LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I'm the best person using it well. Um, but I guess I'm trying. So I don't, I don't really. Yeah. All right. Well, Sandy, I know Sandy has an opinion here. So Sandy. <laughs> I'm kind of an old fuddy-duddy professor, so I don't really use LinkedIn. So to tell you the truth, I think it's possible I have a LinkedIn profile that like it, there was a time where I thought it was, was a good idea and I haven't touched it in years, literally. Um, I feel like our community is small enough that it's not too hard to navigate without that particular tool. So when we do a faculty search or a, you know, a postdoc search or something like that, I think you kind of know who to ask and where to post things and it's sort of more sort of academic related and we do okay now maybe we would all be better off if we were all on LinkedIn and sort of more better network but I feel like there's enough newsletters around there's I know web pages to go to I know kind of who to ask but if I had a question I'd you know just shoot an email to someone or if I'm I get emails from people hey I'm hiring a postdoc you can send your students my way so it's, I think we're small enough that, that the informal networking seems to be working pretty well, but that's my take. Angela, I know you have an opinion too. Yeah, I, th I mean, I completely agree with her. I, I'm not 100% sure that I don't have a LinkedIn profile because I used to think I created one at some point, but I've never used it. Like for me, it's the same. It's a, I think the, the community works fine, just like going to conferences, meeting people, having all these web pages that we have, that by the way are amazing. I mean, all these resources, because uh, I mean, as I said, I, I'm a mathematician, so I have many friends that did PhD in mathematics and they struggle a lot to find like postdoc positions or professorships or whatever, because in some abstract fields of mathematics, the situation is much more difficult to share. There are not so many resources as we have in this field. So I think we are pretty lucky in this respect and the connections are, are pretty well, pretty well established. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't know anyone close to me that actually uses LinkedIn for research, but it's because I'm probably too far from industry. But I would like to hear. From so I, I'm wondering if anybody in the audience has any comments on LinkedIn. Uh, Robin? Robin, you want to go to the mic? Oh, yeah. I'm Robin Cox. I'm the VP of Control Systems Engineering at Adam Computing. And I actually got my job at Adam by cold emailing the founder on LinkedIn. I have a lot of industry experience and I actually have a PhD in physics, but I had no connections in quantum computing. And so it does work sometimes. So, and I think particularly uh, a lot of quantum computing companies are, are hiring uh, people from academia to do 
very theoretical work now. And it's a very good way to connect with people in industry if you're interested in potentially a career in industry, so. Okay, anybody else have any comments on LinkedIn? Uh, hello, my name's Dominic and I work in, well, tech companies have done for a long time. And I think to, on the point that, yeah, it might be different in industry and uh, academia. Some uh, obvious things, like people change jobs more often in the private sector than, so if you find someone's email address in a paper and email them and don't get a response, it's, you, email addresses are about your job, LinkedIn is about you, you know, yourself and that doesn't change. So for people who change jobs more often, it's a more reliable way of getting in touch. And then, I don't know if this goes for all LinkedIn users, but I ignore messages where someone just clicked a button and said, I want to link with you because, it could, well, there's just too many and it's kind of just link spam. Um, but if someone includes a reason and the reason is more than the kind of standard hiring or sales, hey, I wanted to get in touch with you because we're awesome. That's a very bad introduction. So just, just think of it as an email introduction. You would never just write to someone and say, hey, I want to be your friend. So you just include a, you know, a couple of letter asking your question, explaining things, and it's more likely to, to get me than an email address from, well, an email address from a previous job just won't work. So yeah, useful for that. All right, thanks. Any other comments? Um, I don't mind to change the subject, but I think it's related enough to just say it. Uh, what about Twitter? I know there's quite a few people in the community that use it very actively, um, but I don't think that's everyone. What is people's take on that? That's a great question. Thank you. Good subject change. Uh, I personally think Twitter is more useful than LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Maria, I'm a PhD student, and um, I found LinkedIn to be really useful. So I made a LinkedIn account um, years ago just because it was actually a, a kind of women business event, and they encouraged us to all make an account, and I didn't really know what I'd use it for, but I've actually found it um, useful both from the perspective of having had like students who are interested in doing PhDs or interested in working for companies that I've done internships with, they've approached me and asked if they can meet up with me or something to discuss or ask for advice on, um, yeah, on career opportunities. And I've also found it useful for getting in touch with people like um, uh, connected with Denise on LinkedIn and we organized a QA and a with Oxford Quantum Information Society for that. And um, yeah, I've uh, also had um, people approaching me to discuss different quantum events and initiatives and things. So, um, and I found out really useful things from the newsfeed as well, like initiatives that I can get involved in as well. So yeah, I think it's a really good way of um, connecting with people and finding out what's going on in the community. Thank you. Um, any, any other comments? So um, how about the panel? Do you follow Twitter more than LinkedIn? I, I yeah, mean, no, I'm I, not getting it. It doesn't look like it. No, I, I think I said this before. I think I've never used Twitter, which is probably really odd. Um, so if I understand there is a lot of like quantum information Twitter news going on. So yeah, I guess I sort of mentioned that before, but I guess I sort of feel like I am missing the Twitter schemes and maybe that means I should join. But Yeah, I also don't use Twitter at all. Um, yeah, I think I'm maybe I'm just like too behind the times for <laughs> Twitter or something. Um, yeah, I also don't use LinkedIn as much either. Sandy. Mm -hmm. But I do read people's blogs quite a bit. So that's sort of like in a more extensive when someone has something longer and thoughtful to say, I'm usually interested in that. And I appreciate the fact that people take the time to do that. So that's that's been pretty useful to stay up to date with things and to find out it's sort of fun to get people's, you know, high level opinions of things and what's going on in the field. So I guess that's a lengthier version. of Twitter. Yeah, so I, I think there's a mix of people that are just Twitter followers or people that are LinkedIn. 
Um, one question is, what blogs do you find useful? Um, I know Scott Aronson's yeah, blog is, is like the epitome of blogs for me. Mm -hmm. um, any other blogs that you guys use or like? Scott sets the bar pretty high. He does okay, set the yeah. bar pretty high. Yeah. yeah. Does the audience have any blogs that they follow? Okay. No. Good question. Um, what I do want to do is talk a little bit about uh, QIP as an event. Um, just a show of hands. How many of you have been to QIP before? Wow, that's great. And how many is it your first time? That's also great. Um, welcome to Pasadena. Um, one of my questions is uh, to the panel about a strategy to attend events. I know when I went to my first scientific meeting, I felt a little lost. And I'm wondering if you guys could give us some tips on what you think is important for attending a scientific meeting on how to get the most out of it. So Sandy, I'm gonna point at you again. Yeah. Um, well, an important thing is to pace yourself a little bit. Um, it's information overload. So, you know, I, I guess when I first started going to academic meetings, I thought I was supposed to attend all the talks and understand, all, understand them all. And, and so I think it's important to pick and choose. Um, it's pretty easy to meet folks, like just the person you're sitting next to at a talk or, you know, um, out in the coffee. So I sort of, you know, I'm naturally an introvert. So I sort of push myself to get out there a little bit and find meet new people. Um, after you've been attending them a while, then you have a circle of people that you know, and it's, it becomes easier. So that, that is um, something to look forward to if you're just starting to attend conferences. After a while, you kind of know a certain set of people and, and it's, you're reconnecting with old friends and it's a lot of fun. Um, so pace yourself. And then I always, you know, I make sure to take time to go for a run or go, you know, do something on my own or just sort of to step back from it a little bit. Um, for me, that's refreshing and I, it helps prevent me from getting too burnt out um, at events like this, you know, so it's a lot of information over a long period of time. So um, I think it's just good to sort of step away and, and take some time out from it as well. So. Yeah, for me at the beginning, it was also the same. I kind of thought that I had to attend all the talks and try to understand as much as possible. And then at some point I realized that sometimes uh, the coffee break is more useful than the talks themselves, even if I, sh I shouldn't say that. But like, for example, in my personal experience, I, when I was like in my second year of, of PhD, I went to a thematic program and when well, we worked together there with many people for, for many weeks, and we had a coffee break every single afternoon just to interact with, with people there, you know? And the organizers had the idea that every day one person had to present their, their own work. And they started with the juniors because in this way it was easier to break the ice. And that was possibly the most important experience I've had in my career. Because when I presented my work there, it's actually when some more senior researchers saw what I was doing and they started interacting with me. And this is how I could start interacting with them and also with some junior people. And some of my collaborations from after that moment have started in that specific moment. So I think uh, it's very important to attend the talks and learn about these new topics that are super interesting for us, of course, because this is why we're here. But it's also pretty important just to, to socialize with people and talk, chat uh, with people over coffee. And as you are saying, just to do some, some leisure activities together, just some, some hiking, some I don't know, some scene or whatever. Can I add something? Yes, please. Um, I, I mean, I love events like QIP that are big like this, but I personally find it a little easier to navigate the smaller workshops and conferences. Um, they tend to be a little bit more slower paced. People are sort of more open to sitting around and chatting and talking about open problems. And, and usually there's, it's a smaller group that's more closely connected to stuff that you work on. Um, so that's, those have been critical for me, the, the smaller venues. Um, and they're often by invitation, but usually people are happy to invite you or you ask your advisor, hey, can I, I hear something's going on? Do you think you could ask the organizer to invite me? So if you can get, and you know, once I sort of had my first paper in the field, I started getting those invitations. And 
those are the things that you really want to get to because um, I think it's a little easier to network and meet new people at those those types of events. So, so one point is is when I go to a meeting like this and there's so many people I don't know, half of me feels pressure that I need to meet everybody. And then the other half is really shy and says, no, I don't want to do that. How do you, how do you all handle that? Do you try to meet people? I, I normally set a quota, I meet five people and then I'm happy with myself. But do any of you think about that in trying to meet new people? No, I'm the only person. That... No, okay. Or... You know, it doesn't always come naturally to me to just go out and start introducing yourself. So I do actually push myself a little bit to do it when I feel like there's a place where I don't know a lot of folks. Um, and when you introduce yourself, so one of the things I find is that it's really important to have a sentence describing, hi, my name is, this is what I do. Um, often I find people just come up and say hi, and I'm like, uh, tell me about yourself. So. Yeah how would you like to be approached or what kind of thing would you like to hear if somebody came up to you? Usually it's easiest to talk about what you work on. So um, if it's someone who's given a talk, then that's just sort of a natural conversation starter if you have a question or something about what their paper was about. So that, that's the easiest one I think to do, but you can sort of just ask people what they work on, where they are, you know, um, okay, Angela. Yeah, for me, it's also a bit hard to go directly to people I don't know and just introduce myself, you know, and just as, as you were saying, I try to push myself. I, I, what I usually do is if I've met someone before, even if I met this person like three years ago, and for certainly this, this person is not going to, to remember me, then I try to push myself to go and say hi, you know, and, and try to catch up or whatever. And, and in this way, you interact a bit more with people. But for me, to be honest, it's much more comfortable to just hang around with the people that I already know and with whom I usually collaborate and everything. But I know that this is not good for us because it's, then it doesn't expand your collaborations and that's part of the purpose of having these kind of conferences. So I think it's just some, some small, well, or not so small exercise that some of us have to do. I agree, and it's hard. Um, Harriet or Laura, you wanna to add to that? Um, yeah, I guess just like, yeah, repeating what everyone else has said. Yeah, I think that I do try to push myself to meet some new people, um, especially if it's someone who like I've heard the name of or I've read a paper of, I try to like go up and introduce myself, try to find like a yeah a small conversation starter, whether or not it's like, oh, I heard that you worked with this person or something. Um, yeah, and just trying to like get myself out there more. Yeah, I think it's good. I think we can all kind of go into ourselves at conference and just listen to a talk. So I encourage you to meet other people. One of the things we talked about as a panel is, do you all know who you're sitting next to? Um, can we just take a minute and you guys meet the person sitting next to you to your right or to your left? Um, it's kind of like being in church, but uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> All right. Cool, I'm glad that everybody got to meet someone new, I hope, um, just in this couple last minutes. Um, a couple questions is, um, what career resources do you all find useful to help you navigate your career? Is it going through your professor, 
how do you, what do you find useful to navigate and to think about your next steps in your career? Ah, we have someone running to the mic fast. <laughs> that was fast. Uh, this actually relates to the question I wanted to ask. Um, so uh, I volunteer for IEEE quantum education and I wanted to know about um, what, uh, the, uh, also, not only what mentorship we've received in order to get to the stage, but also what kind of how we can pass on that mentorship to the future of quantum. Um, specifically, there's uh, a lot of, especially for uh, underrepresented minorities, it's hard to even have the opportunity in the first place to learn uh, some new subject that is um, that that is a uh, if you don't see yourself uh, in the people who are currently working in the field, it's really hard to um, to imagine working in it in the future. And so uh, I wanted to ask, um, what kind of what is something that the people in this room in the field could do to um, help pass on the mentorship, uh, especially with regards to helping the future generation builds confidence and bridge the skills gap? That's a great question, thank you. Uh, Angela, do you wanna start? It's complicated. <laughs> it is complicated. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have a solution, I think. So there are many things that people can do, of course, like to, to try to, to help with that, with that problem, I think. Um, of course, like, some measures that are being taken in many institutions are being taken like at, at a, in my opinion, at a very late uh, point. So I think you have to go like very early, like to high school students or something like that and start promoting that diversity is, is good, you know, that there are these minorities that are underrepresented in these uh, communities, but it doesn't mean that it's because they shouldn't be there. It's because there is a consistent problem that has been there for a while and then one needs to fight against. So of course, uh, I've attended like many many talks about this topic, and everybody gives you like a different possible solution, and none of them agree on something. But I think that some some things that are important are just like giving positions for for minorities, you know, like like devoting specific positions to to some underrepresented communities within your community or something like that. Or when you are giving, I don't know, when you are like advertising a position then in, and you have like several candidates and some of them are tied and one of them belongs to a minority and another one doesn't, then try to push a bit more, you know, for the unrepresented, underrepresented person and so on. But that's at a very late level. I would say that at, at you know, at, a, at an earlier stage, uh, just giving talks and interacting with high school students and, and I don't know, telling them that this should be open for everyone. It, I mean, like uh, quantum computing is not for, for male or it's not for, you know, for, for the typical people that we find in conferences like this one. It's for everyone. So, um, so I want to add, there are resources for mentorships. I think both where you go to school as well as in the quantum community. So I do work with a group called Women in Quantum, which I don't want to advertise, but there is a free mentorship program associated with it. And we do have people like Professor Will Oliver from MIT, who's a mentor. So we do have a lot of academic mentors. If that's a resource that could be valuable to you, feel free to ask me about it, or you can find it on the internet. But I, I would point out that there are a lot of programs. If you look around for, uh, diversity, uh, diversity support or a student club, or just there's various resources around. And I think sometimes you need to just almost do a little investigative work and find something that you're comfortable with. Any other comments from the panel? Nowadays at the undergraduate level, there are more opportunities to take a class in quantum computing and as an undergraduate and learn about the field. Um, I'm teaching one now. I have a it's pretty big, it's like a, about 80 students. And I was pretty horrified at the first time we had an in-person test. I looked out at my class for the first time and there were like five women among 80. And it's like, oh, wow, we got to do something. So, you know, one of the things that I, 
I've thought of doing is trying to actually specifically tap students who have done well in their theory courses and say, hey, I think you'd be a great candidate to take quantum computing. So to actively sort of recruit for the class, um, I realize now I should be doing this. So now, you know, I will do it for the next time around and I will, you know, ask my colleagues to identify strong um, students from, you know, women and underrepresented groups who I can just say, hey, I think you'd be a great candidate for the course. So that's one way to sort of start involving people. You, we have to be a little bit more proactive than just putting up the course and hope they'll come. So. We have another question. Or did we answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so maybe it's a good time to give a pitch to the Alice Facebook group, but also just Alice as a community. Um, so Alice is originally started for women in quantum information. And I think we're thinking about changing the name potentially to Alice and Charlie, but it's not official yet. So it's just to include the gender minorities and, you know, I mean, it's always included, but the name hasn't reflected the mission change and the inclusivity of the group. And um, so, I mean, tomorrow we are having a meetup. Alice is meeting up uh, at 11.45 to 12.45. Uh, over there near the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> the tables near the bathroom there. So probably just there's hopefully enough space for all of us. And so anybody here is welcome, invited to come and, and you know, and we'll share, of course, tell you a little more about the Facebook group, but also if you, you are on Slack workspace for QIP, you can uh, go to the channel called Quantum uh, Women in Quantum Information. I mean, what, Women in QI. Uh, and so uh, many updates, announcements about the, any events or any communication will be happening there. So just a way to keep connected. So, so that will be, you know, a lot of uh, senior women in the field are already in that community in that community. So, um, so that will be a good place to come and meet professors and female professors uh, and or gender, you know, um, like non-binary professors, whatever. Uh, anyway, so it'll be cool to see many of you there. All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a comment about mentorship and like particularly I used to kind of think like I can't, I have to be like a big shot or something to like really help someone. But then when I look back at the really influential people along my path, they're usually like, you know, who have the most influence or someone that like, they're not so far ahead of me that I can feel like a more connect, a more personal connection with them. Um, and like even someone who knows just a little, they have a little more experience in an area that I have no experience in, like they can offer so much insight and encouragement to me. And that, like, I think it's hard to realize how much influence you can have if, if it's only like a marginal, a small difference. Um, but um, I try to like knowing that now, I kind of try to just, just like the way I carry myself, make, make it seem like people can kind of ask me anything or talk like I don't know I just try to not I don't know if I could be intimidating if I wanted to but I try to just like actively not be intimidating um because yeah the people who have like influenced me the most are people who like had some experience and you know just kind of like told me like you're good at this you should do it and so I really liked Sandy's idea of like tapping people who are good like you know they're like smart and they could succeed but like maybe they don't really know about this one area that is super interesting and exciting because like how would they know about it probably none of their friends are interested in it so uh yeah i guess it's a good idea just tell people like when they're smart that oh you should do this with your intelligence and that'll that'll do a lot for them <laughs> i think you. that's a great point i think we all need to be kind to each other and compliment them and tell them when they're doing something good next question Hi, oh, ooh, this is, okay. So I don't know if we're still answering the original question, which was um, the quantum resources that you use to decide your career path, but I just want to give my two cents really quick before we run out of time. Um, so I think it's very important to first like realize like where do you wanna be in your life? Do you wanna be a leader or do you wanna be a follower? Um, and if you wanna be a leader, you wanna be your own boss, then you have to determine like, okay, what steps do I need to get here? And once you decide that, it's very important to talk to the right people. So for example, I'm an undergraduate. I know I wanna be in industry in the future. Um, a lot of people in academia 
they may be a little biased saying, okay, go for the PhD, go for a PhD. But sometimes it's not always necessary. It's a very big decision to make because you're investing like a lot of time um, in a PhD. So if, you're, if you come to events like this, it's very important to meet the right people and ask them, hey, in order for industry, what do I need? What sort of career path do you recommend? What courses do you recommend that I take? And go from there. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great point. Thank you. All right. We are quickly running out of time. Are there any more questions from the audience? Have we demystified diversity? Do we have a question here? Yeah. Sorry, so there is one question from sure. the chat. Uh, um, it's a first year master's student asking, what's your take on the decision between pursuing a PhD in academia and a, a quantum engineer in a big tech company or research lab? Could you repeat that once more? I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah. So the, the question is, is asking, do you have any advice or, uh, on the decision between pursuing a PhD in academia or being a quantum engineer in a, in a tech company? Uh, is the second choice with a PhD or without a PhD or? I'm not sure. Not sure, okay. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to try for that. I cannot say much. Uh, Harriet, do you have a? Comment? I would just say I, I, I'm enjoying my PhD. So I think <laughs> enjoying a PhD. Well, if, if you think, I think that's like a personal question. If you, yeah, I guess maybe think about whether you want to do a PhD and you think you'd enjoy it. And then if, if the answer is yes, then do it. But if you don't need to enjoy it, then no. And then see what career come out with at the end. But I don't know if that's probably bad advice. Yeah, I feel like everyone on the panel is probably pretty biased for this. I think we're all like academics. Um, One yeah. exception, but no. <laughs> all right, you have a comment. Yeah, I have something quick to say on this. So I worked at Rigetti for three years after uh, undergrad and now I'm in grad school. Um, I'd say that the time in industry uh, was pretty illuminating for uh, making me decide that I did want to go back to grad school. Um, but it was also kind of a nice view outside of the kind of sheltered community that academia is. Um, but I think in particular, compared to a lot of my friends who stayed in industry out of undergrad, um, it seems if what you really want to do is do research, uh, academia is by far the kind of, I think, uh, conservative approach to making sure you can have a career doing research. Um, I think quite often if you get a job as a quantum engineer, the fact that the job kind of has engineer in the name means you might be doing more engineering than research um, without a PhD, but that's my two cents. Great comment, thank you. Hi. Um, I also have a kind of a remark for more of the senior people. Like if you're opening up a, a position for let's say a, a student that you want to supervise with their thesis or PhD position or postdoc, or maybe this even applies for like tenured positions, um, really take a good look at the requirements that you set in vacancies and things like that. Because if you have required, like if you have a wish list, like, oh, I wish that in high school you published like 10 papers and stuff like this, then this kind of emphasizes to both people that even though they don't have all the requirements, then they still apply for the position. And it kind of has a disadvantage for people that are like less secure because they think, oh, I don't hit all the check marks, so I'm probably not going to get it anyway. So if you also want to maybe emphasize diversity, it's good to really check like what is an actual requirement and which things you can just notice when you actually have a talk with someone and then see if they're a good fit or not. So that's a really good point, and that's something we didn't get into the panel, but I think um, whenever, I, I guess I'd like to ask the panelists when they look at a job posting or they look at something, that some role that they might be interested in, at what point do you feel I'm going to go for it, or is there any reason why you say I don't meet all the requirements? Um, I guess like if I'm ever looking for like an internship or something, if there's like a requirement on like education level of like you have to be in this year of your undergrad or you have to have like a PhD or something, that's usually enough to like discourage me from applying because that feels like a more hard requirement. Um, I think like I've definitely heard of my friends like being discouraged from applying for something for more um, like skills based or something. But I think for a lot of like internships, if they have certain skills that you need to like know um 
I tend to try to like see if I can learn a little bit of it and see how difficult it would be to just like learn it on the job. And if it, if it seemed to go okay, maybe I'll just apply anyways and see, see what they say about it. Any other comments? Um, I, I'll tell you as someone who actively hires people that when I do a job listing, I may put requirements down and it's a vision, uh, but it, whenever people's resumes come in, I try to look at them as individuals. So I don't view a job listing as an absolute, like you must have 100% of this. I look at it as a vision for what I'm looking for and try to understand how you could fit in and, and help out with that vision. Um, any other questions? Uh, just again, from the point of industry, please apply. Don't be that person who looks at a job description and says, oh, it says it needs three years of Python and I've only done it for two and some of that was Java. Please apply because you're doing everyone a favor and think there's always going to be someone who's saying, who's saying, oh, I can do that job, whatever it is, even if they're not qualified at all. And I'll bet you dollars for donuts that person is almost overwhelmingly a guy. So just don't, don't not apply please. I agree with you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, just to steer the topic back to diversity, I was wondering, um, so where does the responsibility fall? Or basically for things to be better, do we just now wait and see the effects of recruiting more women in, into these university courses, et cetera? Or, you know, what does the panel think we could do now if we if we notice certain things? Just a disclaimer, I'm really happy in the research group I'm in right now. <laughs> Everything, everyone's really nice. But I've had some like experiences before that made me think twice, you know, about staying in academia as a woman. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if the panel has any comments on that. And what we can do now if we notice things, or you know, or what we could do now when we notice even small things, well, big things, but even if we notice harmless things like authors on papers being mostly male, right? We don't really see female only papers in quantum information. I've, I've seen a couple, but you know, they're virtually non-existent. So, so yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we both, we need to sort of do both. We need to think about our pipeline and recruiting new people, but we also have to make our community as welcoming and comfortable for everybody as we can. So I they're not mutually exclusive and they're both very important. Um, I did work with a, a committee in the CS theory community to sort of provide some programs and facilities to you know, address harassment issues. And even if it's not high harassment, if it was just sort of like a micro little thing that happens and sort of um, part of what we tried to do there is just make the community more aware of how certain actions might be perceived. And it's, it's the kind of thing where if you notice something off, like someone makes an off comment or sort of how to support someone or diffuse a situation or um, sort of address things in the moment as they're happening. So I think the more awareness we all have about those things, the better off we are. So we can sort of, you know, help one another in terms of sort of navigating the field. I think that's a great closing comment. Uh, we're running out of time and I know you all need to eat lunch before you go on to the next session. So I wanted to thank you and feel free to come up and talk to us. We'd love to hear your other comments and thank you very much for participating. And also I think Thomas, do you, do you wanna add something? Here he comes, no? Um, there are lunches for those of you that signed up uh, for this session. So um, thank you, and you can uh, hopefully have a great lunch and meet someone new today. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. I just want to send my, my own thanks to, to Denise uh, Ruffner for setting up the, the panel. She's the one who contacted me and suggested that we organize it. That was a great idea. So let's thank all the panelists and Denise for, for setting it up. So yeah, please grab a good box lunch, enjoy it outside, and you have just the right amount of time to take, it, take in a bit of sun and be back for the, the afternoon session.